$50,000, if we're producing 125 tons, oh, excellent. If we're producing 125 tons, we've got that fixed cost down to about, oh my goodness. From here, not here? Yeah, that's Either one. That won't. This is, all right, this is going to be hard, but okay. Do you want me to advance them? Uh, if, well, it's, it's going to, I'll do it. All right. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so here's where we are right now. Again, notice where we'd have to be to, for that same fixed cost level, it's about 125 tons. So again, $50,000 is not a lot of equipment to have and still be at that fixed cost level. So let's take that $30, or $30 per ton, and essentially we'll use that as a basis for the rest of our budget, our hay budget. In other words, can we, can we make money at 30, if, if we do get those fixed costs down to $30 per ton? And we'll look at that. We'll look at that with a couple different scenarios. Uh, we'll look at a traditional two cut system where it's a dedicated hay field. We, you know, hopefully in this area we get two cuttings, right? You get one hopefully by, if you're lucky, early June and another one later in the summer. We're also going to look at what I call a hybrid system where you're it's, you, you actually have fencing around it, so you can use this pasture. We're going to take the first cutting off it, and then we're going to pasture after that. And it makes a big difference. So let's start with a two-cut system. I'm going to go through this. These are just my assumptions in terms of some cost. One critical thing here is once we bail it, this two-cut system, we're going to move it to central location on the farm, right, which we typically do, and then feed it with a tractor after that. Now, with this system, I'm assuming custom rates here. That's a big assumption I'm making here. So think about a custom operator that does a lot, you know, 1,000 acres or so per year. Their, their fixed costs are going to be a lot lower than the average hay producer, right? So I'm going with that, and their costs are going to be about $15 per ton. In other words, that's, a, that if we, that's about the best case scenario we could hope for, having fix, fixed costs at $15 per ton. We're going to first see how this will look at that level, and then we'll change it. Other assumptions here, we're going to assume a, this, again, two-cut system, three tons overall yield over the course of the year. We're going to be completely clover-based, so no nitrogen in the spring. Um, the other key assumption is that we are replacing the P and K levels at two-thirds of removal rate. Now, notice I didn't say 100%. You know, long-term, soil scientists may say we need to do 100%. I don't completely understand mineralization, all that, but we're going to start with two-thirds. We'll go up to full later on. And let's have an assumption, and back in Kentucky, this would be an optimistic assumption that we're getting $70 a ton for our hay. I don't, you know, it's going to be different, different place. We'll start with that. So three tons times $70 a ton, so that's our total revenue, just on a per acre basis, $210. Now, I'm not showing the details on all the variable costs. You're going to have to kind of trust me on that. I don't have time to go through all that, but about $170. That would include, um, that would not include labor. I'd put labors in the total fixed cost here. So $70 in total fixed part, of the biggest chunk of that is the machinery fixed cost that we just talked about. So in this case, 15 times three or $45, the rest of that would be in labor. And if once we do that, the net revenue down here, essentially other assumptions, I've got 30, <sighs> I didn't even touch anything. Okay, I won't even walk in front of it. We've got ghosts. Yeah, and don't worry too much about that, but that's assumption. I probably should have put it in variable, but some people consider it fixed, some people variable. And the variable yeah, all, all those things. Now, I'm not going to go up there, but if you look, I try to put all my assumptions here. I've got land rent at $30 an acre. We'll up that later on. I'm guessing I'm, on the low, I'm definitely low average place in Kentucky. So, yeah, $15. Key assumptions here are $15 per ton fixed cost, $30 per acre land rent and two-thirds P and K removal. If you look at that, our, and we, we are putting land in here and we are putting labor, but we've lost about $30 an acre. In other words, on our hay enterprise, we're losing money when you count for all those things. Now let's, I would argue these are actually optimistic assumptions here. Let's change some of them. And I'll, again, I'll let you pick whatever you think should, we should be. Let's go, let's put a lower price in there. So everything's the same except we're gonna have $60 per ton for the value of hay. We lost about $60 an acre. Let's change it again. Instead, so we're going back to $70 a ton, but we're going to increase our fixed costs. So we're going from 15 to 30. We've lost about $70 an acre. 
change assumptions again. We bring our fixed costs down to $15 a ton again, but we're going to have full P&K replacement, and that's at 50 cents per unit for P&K. We've lost about $60 an acre. Let's throw the whole thing together, see how it looks. Actually, not the whole thing together. Oh, um, no, it's not the whole thing. I'm bringing P&K replacement down to two-thirds again. But we're have, we have a lower price. We've got $30 per ton fixed costs, and we're increasing land rent to $50 an acre, which I would... For that type of land, it's probably more realistic. Do you all want to see this or not? For the privilege of putting that land to hay production, you lost about $125. It doesn't look pretty. Now, a couple key things. I'm not saying you can't make money with hay here, but this is, you know, that's with fixed costs at probably a little bit better than average that I see. A cu again, a custom operator can drop that by about $15 per ton, so we're at three tons we bring that down $45, but we're still losing a lot of money on that. What's the biggest reason that this looks, this, this is so negative right now? And again, this, this will get back to the fifth thing we're talking about in terms of market changes. What's the biggest increase in price for haymaking in the last six, seven years? Fuel. It's not fuel. Machinery it's not machinery costs. It's fertilizer. Your P and K is, is more than tripled in the last seven or eight years. And we use more of that than fuel on a, on a per, per dollar base when we started out. Fuel's big, is definitely increased, but actually, and this is why I think people get in trouble. It's actually the fertilizer that's, that's hurting us the most. So keep that in mind. All right, let's go to the one cut system. And I really like this. This is what I started this year on, on the farm that I partnered with our beef cattle specialist with. What we do, and we just kind of explain as we go along, so I'm going to argue we can get about two, on that same productivity, we can get about, about two tons per acre, and I'll explain why. I'm, I'm going to argue that you can get a better clover stand established in this type of system than you can a, a dedicated hay system where every year you're essentially letting that hay grow up every year. So essentially here, if you're rotating this, first year, and this is what Chris was talking about, and, and I found this out by pure dumb luck, but if you graze that hard in the springtime, You'll, kind of, you'll keep the competition down from the grass. You can let the, the clover get established better. And so if you kind of rotate that, you cut that on your second year. Essentially, first year, you, you graze it full time. Second year, you can cut it for hay the first time and pasture it afterwards. And I'm going to argue that actually we can probably do, we can go lower than one third P and K replacement because what we're going to do is instead of moving that hay to central location on the farm, after it's bailed, we're going to move it to the side of the field, maybe three or four locations, and we're going to feed it in the same field that we cut it in. In other words, we're going to put those nutrients right back on the same field that was taken off. So long-term, the extra soil scientists tell me that we can go down to close to zero you know, replacement rate long-term. That's a key assumption. All right, so very quickly, and I'm going to argue that the value of that hay is going to be better than it was before because, again, we're going to have more clover in that than we did before. And especially if we get it cut late, that clover is going to hold its value a lot better than the grass. So we'll kick that up to $80. We actually made money on that system. Now, a key assumption I made, and let me explain. I'm only, so instead of having $50 per acre land rent, I dropped that to 20 Now, why should I be legitimately be able to do it? We've got another use. We're, we're using about a third of the time for hay and about two-thirds for grazing. So I'm kind of prorating. Does that make sense? And the other reason that we actually made money here is, is actually the fertilizer. We're, we're, putting down a, we're removing a lot less than we were in the two-cut system. Most of it's being distributed right back in the same fields. Okay, let's drop the, the value. So let's take it down to $70 a ton. We still made a little bit of money, $10, $15. It's a whole lot better than minus 100 though, right? And actually, I would argue that we could probably add another 10 to $15 per acre to that. Maybe why could I legitimately do that? I just bush hog that, right? Real close. In other words, if you're, if you're like me and you typically bush hog your pastures, I just did it there, right? I should essentially be able to add that to the value of, of that system. And then if we actually go down to the zero you know, replacement rate, so long term, we should be close to that. We actually have decent profitability on that. And again, we have it for two-thirds of the time. Hopefully, we're making a profit on, on the livestock grazing portion of it. Any questions on that? Yeah. Have you adjusted your fixed cost to account for fencing and water systems in order to graze it? We're making the assumption that it's on pasture already. 
But that would be, in other words, if, if this isn't a faraway hay field, yeah, then we've got to consider that. But that's a good question. But, but the answer is, we're assuming this is all, you know, everything's pasture to begin with, or everything's fenced to begin with. All right, let's talk about grazing costs now. All right, question. You can vote on this. Can I universally say that every day that we can, additional day that we can graze, that we're going to increase our profits? Who says yes? Who says it depends? Okay, for those who said yes, I'll try to prove you wrong here. I'm going to say typically this is probably true. But I'm going to argue not always. It depends. So let's look at one example. Let's say this is our base situation. Let's say we're feeding hay 60, we're only feeding hay two months out of the year. Oh, I'm not going to go up there. <laughs> we're only feeding hay two months out of the year. So we're already, we're already doing a lot of extended season grazing to get this, right? I would argue. And to do that, we have two acres of pasture per cow to get us there. So this is a very efficient farm here, I, I would argue. Let's say that we're going to increase the, the amount of days that we graze from, or decrease the amount of days that we feed hay from 60 to 15. So we're down to two weeks of hay feeding, but to get that, it's going to take us three acres of pasture to do it. Does that mean we're going to absolutely increase our profitability on that? The answer is it depends, right? What are the two primary things that are going to sway the calculus on this? The cost of hay. The cost of hay. So and if we're at the base situation, if the cost of hay is really high, that's going to make the second one look more attractive, right? All things equal. What's the other one that's going to do the reverse, though? Well, it, we could look at it in terms of cost of rent. I, w I was looking at more from profitability per cow. So in other words, to go to the second situation, we're going to have to decrease our stocking rate, right? So if our, pro our original profitability per cow is really high, it's actually going to make the second situation look less attractive, right? Conversely, if the profitability per cow is really low to begin with, it's going to make the second situation look better. The answer is it depends. Again, typically, this statement is probably true. On average, and this is the thing, and the analogy I like to think of or try to get you to think about is think of you know, picking the proverbial fruit off a tree, right? You start with a low-hanging fruit, right? And your efficiency is very high. What happens when we, when we get all the low-hanging fruit, though? What do we have to do? Either get a ladder, if you're like me, just jump up in the tree and start, you know, I love climbing trees, so I jump up there, I'll have a couple tote bags tied me in. Is the efficiency, either if you're on the ladder or if you're jumping up in the tree, is that going to be as good as it was on the ground? No. Your cost is increased, right? So you can't think of your average cost of grazing. You've got to think of how, how, what's the marginal cost? How does that change once you've taken all that low-lying fruit? And let's assume to get to that 60 days of hay feeding, we've picked all the low-lying fruit, right? So to get additional grazing days, it's, it's going to be higher than our average cost of grazing was down low. Does that make sense? All right, so let's compare grazing to feeding hay now. And this is abbreviated. I, I spent an hour doing this in Virginia here a few weeks ago. This is, I'm going to show you some examples that are only that. These are examples. Don't say, you know, Greg Hallich said this is what my grazing costs for what my hay. These are just examples to get us talking. Um, everyone's going to be a little bit different, both for grazing costs and, and hay feeding costs. I've got here pasture maintenance, labor, and, and pasture rent. I've got that, at, you add all those, and this is on a per cow grazing day basis. I've got that at a dollar, a little over a dollar per grazing day. On the grazing side, here's feeding hay. Again, this is an example. This, and the hay, I think when I figured that out, the value of the hay was essentially about $100 a ton. So higher than it would be if you probably bought it, but probably lower than if you're a really inefficient producer in terms of what you produce it for. Uh, so that's $2 per cow day, machinery and labor, about 45 cents. And I actually have a nutrient credit in there, so, because if you're feeding hay in a, in a pasture that actually needs it, you could, you'll get additional benefit. And that was only, I think, using about 35% utilization of, of that, those nutrients back on the pasture. That brings it to about twice the, the grazing cost, right, on a per day basis. Again, just an example. So if we, if we compare the two, we subtract the grazing cost from the hay cost, we have a grazing advantage of a little over a dollar a day, right? Dollar seven. Now this is coming back to what we just talked about, low-lying fruit, though. Does that mean that every additional day that we can graze, we're going to save a dollar seven per cow day? And the answer actually is no for two reasons. One is the, the low-lying fruit, right? 
So when we've got that, we've got to get up higher in the tree. It's going to cost us more to do it, right? So it's going to make that cost manage smaller the farther we go. What's the other reason why that won't necessarily be true? This is the first one. What's the second reason? And this is important. What if what we do is we so we're able to we're able to reduce the amount of days that we feed hay, but we do nothing to our equipment. In other words, instead of producing, I'm just making up numbers here, instead of producing 100 tons of hay, we only produce 75 tons of hay. Do we still have most of the fixed costs involved? The answer is yes. We, there's a little bit of variable in that fix, but most of those fixed costs are still there. So if all we do is make less hay, we, actually our cost per ton goes up. And this is probably the, the biggest, or the, the main way I see people getting in trouble here is they assume that their cost, if, if they do nothing with equipment, will go down. And the answer is not, not necessarily. A lot of it's still there. The only way it's going to go down fully is if we essentially produce the same amount of hay and we sell the excess hay at what? The cost of production. But if it's costing us 100 tons to produce it and we sell it for $60, we've, we've lost that money. Does, do you all see that? So you get, and again, I spent a, an hour just on this thing. We're, we're going through it quickly, so I just want you to understand the main concepts. We're not going to be able to go through a lot of examples, but I'm hopefully getting through to you on that point. All right, let's talk about buying hay. So the easiest way to get around this is to essentially not have any hay making equipment, right, and to buy it. And I'm not saying that's for everyone, but let's just look at an example here. Um, the main thing, though, is if we buy our hay, we can't keep that same equipment, right? In other words, if you have hay making equipment, you can't simply just put that in the shed, buy hay, and expect to save on your overall operation, right? You've got to restructure your operation to do it. And that's hard for people, I understand. Psychologically, it's hard. I'm not saying this is typical. I'm just showing an example that this could happen, and we'll, I want you to see how low this cost can potentially get. Let's, assume, let's say that we can buy our hay for $60 a ton. I know a lot of people tell me, you know, on average, they can get their hay for $60 a ton. Let's say we're really efficient in terms of feeding it, and we have a 15% waste rate. And let's say we sold all that equipment except maybe, well, let's, let's, I'm even going to, I'm going to be radical here. Let's assume we sold all the tractors. And I'm going to argue that you can actually feed hay without a tractor. I'm not going to show you here, but I'll show you later on. And let's just say that we, we're putting on pastures that actually need some fertility. So in other words, we're buying in hay and nutrients. We're, we're redistributing some of those nutrients in the pastures we need. I'm only assuming that we're getting 40% of those nutrients P and K back. I'm, I would argue you can do better than that, but let's just be conserved, 40%. Here's, our, here's how the, the hay side cost changed. The hay itself essentially about drop, doesn't quite drop in half, goes down to $1.17. Machinery and labor went from 45 to 21 because we no longer have that tractor cost, but I did up the hours in terms of people time to feed it, um, and fertilizer credit of 31 cents. If we add that all together, $1.07, what was our grazing cost, average grazing cost? About the same, right? Now, again, I'm not saying this is typical. And actually, I would argue you should not be able to buy hay for $60 a ton because that means someone's selling it essentially under the cost of production. But that doesn't mean people aren't doing it, right? And I would argue long term, there's no way that hay should be valued at $60 a ton. But if it's available, you're not holding a gun to someone's head to, to buy it that, right? So if it's available, why not take advantage of it? All right, so summary here. Again, grazing isn't all cheaper. Um, we don't need to go through it. My basic advice for hay is, if you can do it, hire someone to make the hay on your farm. And hopefully just with a one-cut system. In other words, that you can pasture af afterwards. If you can do it. I know it's not always possible, but if you can do it, that's my number one choice. Number two is buy your hay. Again, as long as it, you know, it's $60, $70, $80 a ton, I can't produce it for that. And then finally, you know, last resort, make it, but you've got to understand you know, that you can't be overcapitalized for your situation. If you're only making $100 a ton or $100, 100 tons of hay per year, you can't have $100,000 equipment to do it. You're never going to make money on it. All right, so let's, talk, let's switch topics here. We're going to look at rotational grazing. And I would, whether or not I should have included this in here, it's, it's probably not a huge profit changer, but the concept of marginality, maybe that's more, more or less what I want to get through here. Essentially, we're going to answer the question, or you're going to answer the question on your specific situation. Assuming everyone's doing rotational grazing right now, 
how much is essentially too much? In other words, we get to a certain point, it probably doesn't make sense to move them you know, more frequently than that, right? So I'm gonna give you a few tables here you can look at to try to answer that for yourself. Uh, so we're gonna look at rotations from one to seven days. We're gonna look at the time that it takes us per, and I threw the 15 just for kicks. I don't think there's too many, but we're gonna look at 30, 45, an, an hour for every time you move the cattle. One hour of additional time for, for mineral checking, et cetera. We're, we'll keep that consistent. We're going to start with 30, which is the average size herd. We'll cut that later on. We'll start with 30. And then $15 an hour for your labor. All right, so up, up at the top, again, that's days between paddock moves. We go from one to seven. On the left hand side, again, that's the time per. Again, I don't think, if you can watch. Uh, but people claim they can do it. It takes me typically 45 minutes on a good day and, and probably on average an hour, but I have to move water and some other things. So if, if you're set up for it, you know, and, and people talk to me that they've got all their, you know, 105 paddocks already set up, but, but th and that's fine, but there's a cost to doing that, right? And you gotta understand that. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but there's a cost to that. So we'll keep it simple here. All right, so let's start, let's assume it's taking us 45 minutes per, you know, per paddock move to move them. We'll start with moving them once per week. Again, this is on a per, gra per grazing day basis, so per grazing cow day. It's costing us about 13 cents in labor for each cow day graze at that level. As we increase our, so we go from once a week to twice a week, and it's costing us now about 18 cents per cow day. We increase that to every two days, goes to 26 cents. We go to every single day, it's costing us 45 cents per cow day graze. Does anyone notice what's happening there? It's increasing real quick, right? Now, essentially, that's the cost of doing that. We have to essentially balance that with the benefit, right, to see what is optimal. So let's do that. And here's the rest of the table. So again, you can pick out where you, know, you are on your current farm operation. Let's just assume that we're, at, we're moving every two days. It's taking us 45 minutes. Our cost would be, 20, again, in this example, 26 cents per, per grazing day. Now, this is with 100 cows. Notice how that changes. And I did bump the, instead of one hour of additional time, I bumped up to 1.5 hours additional time. So in that same situation, instead of 26 cents, it's only costing us nine cents per cow day. Notice how much of a difference it makes how many animals we're moving. So in other words, the more animals we have in our herd, the more frequently we can move them, right? And, and have it pay, the more frequently we can do that. And that's a key because I, I was just on the program a few weeks ago with Jim Garrish, and he's talking about how he advised people to move it you know, every day or so, but he's moving 300 cows. So just keep, you've got to understand where you're at on this continuum. That's why we'll throw a few different examples out here. So this is back with 30 cows. And essentially what you see on this table is additional costs of going, and I put every two weeks in here because we, so if we go from every two weeks to every week, that three cents is how much additional it's costing us to do that per cow day. And again, this is to help us, I'll just go through this. So it goes up to 19 cents. So now we have to balance that with additional benefit we're getting. I'm putting the benefit on additional cow day at what, I, what a custom grazing day typically is. So this is back where I'm from in upstate New York, about 85 cents per cow calf pair in the, in the summertime, about 85 cents per day. That's what I'm valuing. Does that make sense to y'all? And let's assume that we're starting at 125 grazing days per acre. We'll, we'll need that later on. All right, so again, we're looking for at one to 14 days here. So when we go, let's assume it's taking us 45 minutes. When we go from every two weeks to every seven days, what that four means is we have to increase our grazing days by four, eight, four days per acre to make it pay. So if we start with 125 days, my guess is going from two weeks to one week, we can do probably a whole lot better than four extra days, but I'll let you decide what you think that is. Do y'all see what we're trying to figure out here? And that, Everyone's going to have to make their own determination on what that realistic increase in grazing days would be. But in other words, if you can get six or seven, it's better for you to make that move. So in other words, in that situation, you'd be better off going from every two days to, or every two weeks to every week. Now, as we move that, so if we go from every week to, every, to twice a week, it's cost, we have to get at least eight additional grazing days to do that. Can we do that? Again, I'll let you make that determination. If we go to every two days, we've got to increase the grazing days by 12 now. That essentially is a 10% increase, right? Because we went from 125 grazing days 
10% is essentially 12.5 days. Can you do that? I don't know. I would question whether or not moving, you know, essentially going from twice per week to every two days would get you that. I don't know. This I can tell you, if we went from two to one, there's no way that we're gonna get additional 28 grazing days by doing that. All right, so we can fill in the rest of it. Ah, it's no longer working. All right, well, uh, looks like we're gonna get on board quickly. Darn it, I'm gonna be way behind. That's all right. I'll figure out what's important here. Yeah, that's good, thanks. All right, so here's that 30 cow, the whole table filled in. You don't have this, this part, but that's what I'm I'm guessing once we get in the yellow area, it's gonna be hard to do. So in other words, and I'm not gonna go up there, but if you're at 45 minutes per move, we could probably go from once a week to twice a week and make it pay. But I would question whether or not we can go from twice a week to every two days and make it pay. But again, I'll let you make that own determination. Now, notice how this changed when we go from 30 to 100 cows. Again, let me put the yellow in here. So again, the yellow is where I think you'd have a hard time actually doing that. So if we have 100 cows, you could easily go from twice a week to every two days and make it pay, in my opinion. Now, what if you're Jim Garrish? And by the way, I, I learned so much from Jim, and, and actually we just emailed today, so I'm not just actually, but he, he had never seen this before in terms of comparing 300 versus 30 or 30. And he was surprised at what a difference it made. So what if you're Jim Garrish? Can he afford to move every day? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's change gears again. So let's talk about the spring surplus. So. Assuming we're on a cool season grass, you know, base in, in our grazing system, we typically have more forage than we need in the spring and early summer, right? And we dry up and we don't have enough in the summer and fall. So the question is, is there, are there ways to better utilize that spring surplus to increase our profit? So these are just ideas. I'm sure there are other ones. These are just ones that I've seen that I like. Now, actually, this one I don't necessarily like, but let's talk about it because I hear a lot of, not a lot, but I hear enough people talk about doing this that I want to address it. So what, what I'm told a lot of times is a good way to utilize that surplus is to buy stocker cattle in the late winter, early spring, and graze them essentially until it starts getting hot. And it sounds really good in practice, and we'll look at that um, here in a minute. Next, another one is custom grazing, essentially the same time periods, probably beginning of April through end. Third one is hanging that surplus and grazing it afterwards, the one that we just looked at, that one cut system. Fourth one, and this, this is one actually I really like, um, is actually buying stocker cattle in the fall when they're really cheap. You've gotta have a, a surplus at that time. We'll talk a little bit about that, but essentially graze, you know, roughing them through the winter, grazing until late June, selling at that point, you'll probably add 300 pounds to them, uh, sell them on the good market. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And the last one, and this is something I learned about that in the conference, but that's what, this is what they call a summer stockpile. It's not what we typically think of stockpiling, but they're, they're stockpiling the surplus in the spring and grazing that in early and midsummer. It will probably work for, for cows, but we'll look at that. So here's getting stocker cattle. And again, it sounds really good at first, you know, when you first hear about it, but the problem, and I'm a, I'm a stocker operator, by the way. I, I, don't, I do have two cows finally, but... Um, <laughs> I typically buy calves in spring and, and sell them in fall. And I looked at doing this and it just never quite penciled out. And we'll look at why. The question is, can we add enough weight to those animals in that time period? So let's look at it. Now this will change every year, but this was last year when I did this. Essentially what you're looking at here is you're buying a 500 pound steer in late March, early April. And essentially the graph that you see, essentially the net profit per head if we sold at different weights. So in other words, you wouldn't do this, but if you bought that calf and sold it the next day, you're out about $50 per head, right? Because you've got commission, trucking, et cetera. Notice how, and I'll just kind of go through here. Oops. So it takes us about 130 pounds essentially to break even on this calf, right? That's the key point, right? We've got to add a fair amount of weight just before we start making a profit. And if we, and this I would say is almost best case scenario, oh, if we add 200 total pounds to that animal, we're looking at making about $40 per head. Now that doesn't include labor. And, and so for me, and when I look at this, like, and that's if everything goes right. If you have a, a lot of death loss, that's gonna be negative, even at that weight. 
So to me, that is not enough pro potential profit to justify doing that. And it may, some of it may make sense, but it does not, it, it has never pencil out for me to go ahead to do that system. That's assuming you're essentially selling in late June here. What about custom grazing? So during that same time period, and the answer to this is, if it's available, it's a, it would work great, but you've got to ask yourself, who is going to want to have you custom graze for them just for April, May, and June? There's a lot of excess pasture then, right? Now, the only way it would probably work is if you have someone that wants to send those calves to the feedlot in mid-summer, right? And then in that situation, it would probably work, but there aren't that many of those situations probably available. So if it is, it's a great option, but for most people, you're probably going to have a hard time finding that would be my guess. This is one I really like, and that's fall, you know, buying calves in the fall when they're cheap because we've got a flood on the market, right? And, and right now, we've got, we can't put them on cheap grass. We've got to put them on commodity rations, right? So the feedlots are bidding those calf prices down because they can't afford pay a lot for them. So you buy them cheap. Um, so that, and actually, Kevin Laurent in, Western, in, in our Princeton he, um, facility in Western Kentucky, this is what he does. So he, he essentially sells his cattle in July, early August. He lets those pastures stockpile through the summer and all through the fall. Buys his calves when they're cheap, roughs them through the winter time, utilizes that spring surplus growth when they're gaining probably an excess of two pounds per day, and sells them when his pastures start going bad. And I've sat down with him, I've penciled on he it's a pretty good system. It'll take more management because you've got to have cattle in the winter time, so it's not for everyone, but it's something to consider. Next one is summer stockpile. Again, this is in Virginia. I mean, this is essentially what you're looking at. You're, again, you're, you're deferring grazing from that spring. You know, everything's headed out, right? The question is, would I do this with stock kale? No, because you know, your gains are, are not going to be good here. But, you know, from what I saw in Virginia, they're getting acceptable. You know, they're keeping cows in body condition, and they're utilizing that spring surplus. And, they're, and, they're, and by doing that, that's allowing them to stockpile other pastures for that, that late summer, winter, or fall um, stockpile period in grazing in the wintertime. Don't know that much about it. I'm just saying it's something that's worth looking into. All right, change of gears again. Let's talk about the importance of legumes. So essentially we're talking mostly clover here. Now, Gary, this is where I put my agronomist hat. Maybe quickly talk about the advantages of clover. I feel really stupid here even trying to say all this stuff. Okay, so obviously increases overall yield without without actually putting nitrogen down, because we're getting, long-term, we're getting that, you know, that nitrogen recirculation, plus the clovers are growing without it. I would say, you know, an overlooked one is just that improved forage quality, right? We have more clover in that sward. We're getting improved quality. And even more important with fescue-based pastures that we have. And another one that's kind of overlooked is, is, from what I've heard and what I think I've seen and believe, is we get a little bit better improved production in the summertime with a mix of, of grass and clover versus straight grass. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to quantify this. And I'm going to do it fairly quickly. You've got the details there, just because I want to make sure I get through this. So I'm assuming we're putting down 50 pounds of nitrogen in the spring. I've got it valued at 65 cents per unit. It's down a little bit from when I did this. It's probably just under 60 cents a unit, but just, just an example. So we've got $32 in the nitrogen, $6 in terms of applying it. Um, total cost between the two, we've got about $38, $39. Now, the, the, on the um, response rate, I'm assuming we're going to get we're out of that 50 pounds we're putting down. We're, and Gary, correct me if I'm wrong, I would say it's probably, op, I'm not going to say optimistic every year, but if year in, year out, we can get 60 pounds response in the spring, it, that's probably pretty good. So in other words, I'm, I'm probably being conservative here. In other words, maybe I should drop it down a little bit. But I'm assuming we're getting 60 pounds response, dry matter. That gives us 3,000 pounds of additional forage or 1.5 tons, right? Divide 3,000 by 2,000 gives us 1.5. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this on a, the benefit of putting nitrogen down, or the, I'm sorry, we're going to figure out the cost per ton, on a per ton of additional production basis. So we've got our total cost, $38, divide that by 1.5 tons. That will give us the total cost of, of additional ton of forage, right? So we do the math real quick. Makes, gives us $26 per ton produced. Again, I would say that's probably, there's some years you're not going to do that well, though, in terms of that response. So I I'm, I'm hope I'm being conserved on that one. Now let's talk, any questions on this? Because we're going to essentially do the same thing for clover now. But there are a lot more question marks with clover. Okay, so we're going to do this with clover. Here's our clover seeding. So, I, and again, this is just an example. Let's say we're putting down five pounds of red clover, one pound of ladino clover per acre. 
So I've got uh, $15 on the red, $4.50 on the Ladino. And again, an application charge about $6 per acre. We add all those together, it's about $25, $26 per acre. Now this, you know, we're not gonna have to do this every year, right? Hopefully maybe every three years, every four or five. I'm gonna be concerned, I'm gonna say we've gotta do this every three years, but my guess, especially on the Ladino, that lasts a little bit longer. Hopefully we can get maybe four or five years, something like that, but let's just say three years. So we divide that by three. That means on a per year basis, the cost is really about eight or nine dollars, right? Now this is where I, I don't know, and again, we'll kind of put it in table format to let you decide where you think it should be. On the left-hand side, I've got extra forage produced by putting that clover down from essentially a grass sward with no nitrogen. I've got a, everywhere, anywhere from a half a ton per year all the way up to two tons per year. I don't know where we should be on that. Gary, where do you, if, if we have good management long-term, what additional you know, forage production should we have by getting a good clover content in that pasture? A ton and a quarter and a ton and a half is not unrealistic. Okay, and that's actually, I, again, I, I had to estimate something here, but I actually, I almost framed it exactly what you're talking about. I, I'm thinking considerably we should be able to get three quarters of 1.25. You're actually saying pretty, we could probably do a little bit better than that on average. So again, I think we're a little conservative on this, but again, I'll let you decide where you think you should be. Now, what I'm gonna fill on the right-hand side now is essentially the same thing we did with a nitrogen fertilizer, but it's gonna put on a, a cost per ton of additional forage produced. Does that make sense? So when we do that, surprisingly, the cost per ton is quite a bit lower than the nitrogen fertilizer, isn't it? Again, let's assume we're, we're in the, the range Gary talks about here. We've got a range of about seven to $11 per ton. How does that compare with the nitrogen cost? That was $26 per ton, right? Which you think is better, I would say. And again, this does not, we're not valuing the additional benefits. Again, increased forage quality, increased summer production, um, which would, would actually make it look a whole lot better for the clover than what we're even looking at here. The question I have now is, well, two questions actually, let me back up. So one question, again, I didn't know really where we should be on that. I'm just going by my personal experience, but is it realistic to think we can get a one ton increase in forage production per year? Again, this is just based on my experience. I, there's sometimes I wish I, I would have went into agronomy rather than ag econ. So when I'm, when I'm not in my job and I'm back on my farm, I put on my agronomy hat and I like to play an agronomist when I'm not, when I'm not on the job. So this is my brother, in two, this is April 2011. Now the reason we're seeding in, in April is because I just rented out that farm a week before, so we weren't able to do it before that. So, and this is my high-tech seeder, 4150 at Southern States. Um, so again, this was suboptimal condition. Now, do you notice much clover in that stand? Now it's grazed down tight, and this was dumb luck, so, but there's another 24 acres that we end up renting about three or four weeks after this that we were hoping to have rented by this time we didn't. So we were actually overstocked. And exactly what Chris was saying earlier, one of the keys to getting a good you know, clover establishment is, is really reducing that competition in the spring, right? Is that what he said? Well, we did this by dumb luck. In other words, we did not mean to, to have it reduced this well, but by doing this, this was one year and two weeks later on that same field. Again, I am an ag economist. We are not known for biological shrewdness or anything. So I would argue if, and this was by far the best stand that I've had, but again, Jeff Lemkuler estimated we had about two tons of additional forage production compared to an area that we weren't able to frost seed, the one that we got a few weeks later. So even if you cut that in half, we've got that one ton per acre, right? All right, so my question now is why on earth does anyone use nitrogen in the spring? Is that a valid question? Why do you think? All right, we've got, well, we've, let me just cut the chase. The reason is nitrogen used to be a lot cheaper. So if we look at the nitrogen price where originally, that cost goes down from 26 to about seven or $8 per ton. And the answer is habit, because we, what worked 10 years ago, we're hoping it still does now. And the answer is it doesn't, again, because those market conditions have changed. All right, we've got a fly through here. Um, I'm gonna, this much, so reducing fixed costs. I'm gonna cut the chase here. I would argue that there's no reason that most people should have a, a stock trailer. And I'll let you look at your own math. I was concerned on everything I thought here, but the answer is if you get rid of your trailer 
and you get a smaller truck, just on your fixed cost, you can save about $1,200 per year. Again, I'll let you look at the details. Next one, again, this to get you thinking. Do you really need a tractor to feed hay? Here's our tractor loader on our farm. Now, I, I put that there to grab your attention. We only move about four or five bales around each year by rolling up that way. Again, what we typically do is when we, we cut that hay, when it's baled, we move it to the outskirts of the field. And what you don't see here is we've got the rest of the hay there. In, you know, we, we stepped it off with posts. We put poly wire, connect it to the electric, and then we feed it out there. We roll, in the wintertime, we roll the hay out 30, 40 foot, put the hay ring on top. That's how we feed hay. Nope, but we keep it, we generally keep it off the ground. So we have old posts that we put up on, so it gets it up enough where it's not wicking off the ground. We've, we had some that we didn't, and it makes a big difference. Right, but it's still, there's some terrible calculations on loss for when you're not covering. I'll, according to our beef specialists, we, we figure our loss is, is pretty low compared to if we store it. And if you store it, you've got to think about what does that cost you to move it around. For us, it's a lot cheaper to do this. All right, adapting market changes, and since I don't have much time, I'm going to go through this quickly. I'm just going to go to, this is, this is forage finishing beef. Um, I just, again, want us to think about, we, we know that feed costs have increased significantly here the last five, six years. This was the average U.S. corn price during the marketing year between 1997-2005. It was centered right around 225 a bushel, right? And if we look back 25 years before that, adjusted for inflation, it would have still been 20, you know, 2 to 2, 225 per bushel. All of a sudden, we start using ethanol, using corn for ethanol production. What happens to the price of corn? Shoots up sky high. Do you think, again, think of the putting nitrogen down in the springtime. What worked 10 years ago? Is that going to work? Let's look at that. So what I did here, I'm going to go through real quickly. This essentially is comparing finishing a, an animal on, on grain uh, versus finishing on, on, on grass. Now, I had to make a lot of assumptions. You don't see all these here. But let me say this, this set of assumptions only works when you can finish that animal during the grazing season. In other words, this wouldn't work if you're trying to finish that animal in the middle of wintertime. Your costs are going to be higher. So keep that in mind. But if you see, we'll start. So the pasture charge on the left, that's essentially valuing what our pasture is. Per animal, so I've got that from $50 to $150. So at $2 corn, what that $100 means is you would, you would make $100 more profit finishing on corn versus a pasture-based system if, if you're valuing at $100 per steer for your pasture charge. So again, is there a valid reason why we were finishing animals on corn? The answer is yes. It, it made sense back then from a, a pure cost standpoint. $3 corn still made sense, but not quite as, as good. $4 corn, all of a sudden, we flipped, right? We've, we're actually, it's cheaper now. $5 corn, $6 corn, it gets really ugly. Now, does that mean that we're going to switch over the whole industry to a forage finished system? The answer is no. It's going to take a lot of time to do that, right? And it's going to take a lot of years at $5 corn to get enough people to make that switch. Plus, we've got a lot of facilities that are fixed, right? They, they're not just like with the tractors, right? It's going to take years for those to depreciate out. Ah. All right, let's, I'm not going to try to revive it one more last time. Let's just quickly look at your tables here. Ah. Quit mail functions. All right, the next two tables essentially show, show you my actual, pro, or not my actual, but estimated profitability for four steers that we finished this last year. I'll let you look at them, but look at the last, the last thing that says essentially net revenue. That includes everything other than our labor. Did those net revenues look a lot better than a calf that you sell or a stocker calf that I typically sell? If I typically can make $100 per calf, I think I'm doing good on my stocker operation. We were able to net anywhere from almost $400 to almost $700 per animal. Now, there's a little bit more cost labor-wise involved, but the point being, I was, we were really happy with any, anything close to that. So there are definite uh, potential in terms of profitability, especially for a small producer like, like myself or, or probably a lot of you. Um, the last thing I want to talk about here is, and, and this happens a lot, so I was just in upstate New York a few weeks ago kind of talking about this, and I had someone tell me, well, I don't want to over, so the problem that I, I see a lot of times is, is we'll, we'll harvest an animal around 1,000 pounds that really should be 12 or 1,300 pounds before it's really finished. And the reason I hear this a lot is, well, I got to the end of the grazing season, so in New York that's late October, 
it was, you know, it wasn't finished, and I didn't want to winter it one more winter, right? And they tell, and, and because especially up there, that's a couple more months you've got to feed it, right? So let's let's put the pencil to that to really see how that works out. So this is on the last page. So a thousand pound animal, and are you going to get as good a meat yield on a thousand pound animal as you are a twelve or thirteen hundred pound animal? Thousand pound animal, you develop most of the frame, right? So from there on, it's mostly meat and fat. So I've got the yield at, at 37%, 37.5%. That gives us 370 pounds of meat. Let's take it, again, we'll overwinter it. It's about 1,250 pounds, uh, finish it in, in late June. We're going to get a better meat yield. I'm putting 42% there. It's actually lower than what we did. That gives you 525 pounds of meat. Now, that gives us 150 pounds of additional meat, right? 300, or 525 minus 375. Now, let's assume that you're selling at 450 pound kind of freezer beef. Now, you're not gonna get all that because you're gonna have additional processing costs. That's about 75 cents where I take it in terms of, lot of, of actual meat. So subtract out, essentially every, every additional pound of meat, we're getting about 375 of actual increased profit on that. Now, we have some additional costs, right? And I list those on the next one. So I've got, hey, $100 to overwinter that, that steer. Uh, interest, another $15 because we're keeping it longer. Mineral, another $10. I'm trying to be conservative here. Other costs, $25. Um, add all those together, we've got about $150 additional costs. So subtract that $150 from the $560. So that $150 pounds of meat times $375 gave us about an in increase in that revenue of $560. So you subtract $560 from $150, we've increased our net profit by about $400 per animal. Does it make sense to, to take it the extra four or five months, even if we have to overwinter it? I, I can spend a lot of money on hay and make that, make that pan out. Uh, so other, that's all I had in the presentation, other, but I, if nothing else, I want to get you all thinking, because I think that's one thing we don't value enough, and, and with a lot of traditional producers, they get stuck in, in the mentality that they've been doing for the last two or three generations sometimes, so I'm not necessarily advocating everything I showed in here, I just want to get you all thinking, and also pushing the pencil to some of these potential changes. So do we have time for questions? Yes. Yes, sir. What weight calves do you buy? Uh, in a typical year? Yeah. Last year, about 125. What? 125 last year. Oh, what weight? Oh, weight, I'm sorry. Um, anywhere between 450 and, and 600. Yeah. It, it, it all depends on what I think will be most profitable, right? Now, that doesn't mean I'm, you know, a higher weight, I'm going to pay less per pound than a lower weight, but I have that all figured out when I'm bidding on calves. I wouldn't typically go, for heifers, I wouldn't typically go more than 550. And steers, I'd go up to about 600 pounds or so in terms of what I want to add to them weight-wise. Other questions? There's no other questions. Uh, One quick, my contact information is on the front and back of that. If, if later on you have any questions,